Good morning, BBC. Uh, good morning to those online as well. It's good to be with you once again. The greatest fear on earth is when you flush a toilet and the water doesn't flush. I'm sure some of you have been there. I myself, maybe you like me, start to plead with this toilet. Please, please don't do this to me. Please. But no matter what, whether the water goes over the lid or stays in, we all know what we have to do next. We have to get that plunger and we need to start plunging. But has it ever happened to you that when you plunge, nothing happens? This is where real fear sets in, especially if you're at someone else's house. Because <laughs> then you have to have that conversation. Once it happened in my own house that the water wouldn't flush after plunging, and I had to have a conversation with my wife. I had to go tell her about the problem that was in our toilet. And she would then have to go call a plumber. Now, has it ever happened to you that you have a problem, but you really truly don't understand the extent of that problem? This is what happened to me in this situation. I thought I knew what the problem was, but didn't truly understand the extent to that problem. Because as the plumbers came to our house and they stuck a metal contraption into our pipes, what they pulled out, this terrible, disgusting rubbish, made me truly appreciate what the extent of the problem was. See, what I thought was just a few tissues, too many in the toilet, turned out to be nappies and rotten roots of trees and all the things that come out of a human. The things that they pulled out with that contraption will not only haunt me in vision, but in smell for a long time to come. Now, some of you may be thinking, why am I talking about toilets and pipes in a sermon? Well, the reason is, is I think when it comes to our lives and sin, it's a lot like this problem. We think we know the problem, but we don't know the true extent of the problem, really. See, for many of us, we know Romans 3, verse 23. We know that verse, for all have sinned and fallen short the glory of God. What does that mean? It means that every single person sitting here this morning, no matter how long they've been following the Lord, has sinned. We all know that. That's the truth. But the problem is, that's where we take the problem to. We think the problem, we think what Jesus died on the cross for was just merely for the things that we do. But Jesus' death was so much more than that. What he had to die for was not just for the things that you do, but so much more. And so in order for us to truly appreciate what Jesus Christ did on the cross, we need to truly understand the problem of sin. We not only need to look at the things that we do, but we need to dredge up the muck from the deep corners of our soul to truly understand what Jesus Christ has done for us. And so that's what we're going to do this morning. We're going to look at the depth of our sin, because as we look at the depth of our sin, we'll see what it will reveal. And we'll see it will reveal how great our Messiah is. And we're going to do that in two ways. The one way is we're going to go into our text and we're going to see what the Bible says about this. But secondly, I'm going to have three people come up during the sermon to share how Jesus Christ changed their lives as they understood the depth of their sin. So turn with me to our text today, Romans chapter 3 and verse 10. Romans chapter 3 and verse 10. You'll see it on the projector behind me. The screens, here it is, Romans chapter 3, verse 10. As it is written, none is righteous, no, not one. No one understands, no one seeks for God. All have turned aside together, they have become worthless. No one does good, not even one. Now just as we continue, as you catch the depth of our sin, see the rest of these verses. We're going to focus on those first three verses, but see the rest of these verses. This is not nice rhyming language. This is not things that we sing in worship. This is harsh and it hurts. Notice what it says there. 
Verse 13, There's, their throat is an open grave. They use their tongues to deceive. Verse 15, their feet are swift to shed blood. In their paths are ruin and misery. And lastly, verse 18, there is no fear of God before their eyes. That gives a little bit of a picture to us, the depth of our problem. Open graves, ruin, no fear of God. But to really see the extent of our problem, we're going to focus on the first three verses, and we're going to look at our first point. And the first point is this, none is righteous. No, not one. You can attach to that what happens a little bit later in verse 12, no one does good, not even one. So understand what this is saying. This is saying that as humans, we are unable in our own ability to do anything good, to do anything righteous. In fact, as you go look in Isaiah chapter 64, it says that our good, our righteousness that we do in our own ability is like filthy rags to God. Now, this is not saying that God cannot see good or that God doesn't understand good, but rather this is saying that humans are incapable in their own ability to do anything good that could be credited to us. We needed God to step in. We needed it. And the reason this is the case for us is because of what Adam did right at the beginning. Adam was the perfect human. Adam knew no sin. Adam hadn't tasted sin. He was not tainted by it. He was perfect. He was better than us in every single way. But what then happened is Satan deceived him. And as Adam sinned, what happened for every single human, we were doomed in an instant. Every human from Adam would be doomed. And why do I say that? But because of what Adam did, no one ever could do righteous works again. No one could do good. And I know for some of us, we want to have a philosophical debate about this, why this is. And we can have that at another stage. But for right now, what I want you to focus on is the reality of this truth. The idea that if God, in all his guidance and grace, were to take his hand off this earth, to step back, what do you think would happen? What do you think man would do? Would man make this world better? I think if we're honest with ourselves, we know what man would do. Man would bring more pain, more evil, more destruction upon this planet if God was not present. And I know this because even as I look right now, there is pain, evil, and destruction. We need God to step in. We need God to step in for a number of reasons. One of those reasons is in order for us to gain access to him, we need to be righteous. But this tells me that I cannot be righteous. It is not possible. I have nothing in my ability that will make me be righteous. In fact, I desire to go the other way. And so I need Jesus Christ to step in. And this is what is amazing about the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Is that me who cannot do good, Jesus Christ steps in and is the good for me. Me who cannot be righteous, Christ is the righteousness for me. So when Christ dies, it's not just for the bad things I do. He dies so that I am able to do good through his sacrifice. And I want you to focus on that. And I want you to focus on that as I call our first person up. I want you to focus on their story on the idea that they could not do righteous things, that they needed God to step in. They thought they could gain favor with God by their own ability, but were unable to. They needed Jesus Christ's sacrifice. And so Tembi, if you could come up and share with us and listen to her story, how Jesus gives her favor with God. So I became a Christian in 2006. 
and knew nothing about Christianity and very little about Jesus before then. I go to church when I was forced to, but my parents were really strict growing up. So when I left home for my studies, I had every intention of being like other kids and trying all the things, the smoking, the drinking, going to the club, etc. But none of that was filling the God-shaped hole inside of me. I was still quite miserable and I felt so lonely. At the same time, there was a Christian guy on campus who had his eye on me, and in that, God was at work. This guy would invite me to Bible study, and I'd only go because there was food there. But after weeks of trying to get me to go to church, he called me to say he's done trying to convince me. He asked me if he could pray for me, and after that prayer, my life changed. I didn't know who Jesus was before that prayer, but during that prayer, I met Christ and I long to get to know who he is. But that's not the end of the story. Up until 2017, my Christianity was based solely on my efforts. It wasn't ever by grace, and I didn't realize it at the time. As long as I was obedient and observing Christian discipline, I felt like I was doing well. I'd have this checklist that God never intended for me, and I used it to measure myself and others. It was such a reflection of what I believed God love was, sorry. I thought you had to earn God's love, so I would try to purchase his love by being diligent with church attendance, spending time in the word every day, listening to sermons every day, and I even led a Bible study. I tried to make sure that I was a better Christian than others, and then God would love me. But God is wise. All of that time, he knew that I had a, the heart of a hypocrite. I was just doing what Christians are supposed to do because that's how I did everything. At school, at home, at work, I behaved the way a good girl should behave. But in 2019, I got into a very toxic relationship with an unbeliever. And what I thought was backsliding was actually God removing my mask. For the first time in my life, not my background, not my education, not my reputation, now my sense of humor, nothing I was or had could rescue me from my sin and my guilt. Christ did what I couldn't by firstly removing the power of sin over my life and then bringing me back to himself. Because of these deep failures, I never expected God to want me back. I'm definitely a different person now. Like the prodigal son, I finally understood the selfishness of asking the father for my inheritance to squander on the things of this world and saw the intensity of the love of the Father. God lifted his robe in pursuit of me after I repented. And I can't even take credit for that repentance. I'm in awe of God and I'm filled with relentless joy in him. I am dependent on him completely. God loves me and I can finally say I'm deeply satisfied with that in ways I've never been before. So I want to end with something I journaled in 2019. I guess the bright and morning star being the only creator of all things, knew that he could never have a perfect bride. So he made himself a bride and committed himself to faithfully loving her to perfection. I think many of us can relate to Tembi this morning. The idea of trying to gain favor with God. If I just do more quiet times, God will love me. If I just do these things, God will love me more. If I'm a better parent, I'm a better Christian. If I just do these things, I will be better. I'd like to release you from that this morning. It is not possible within your own ability to gain favor with God. You cannot do it. But this is the beauty of Jesus Christ's sacrifice. That you who could not get favor now gets favor because of Jesus Christ. You who looked unrighteous now looks, right, looks righteous because when God looks at you, he looks at you through Christ's sacrifice and says, you are righteous. You are good because of what Jesus has done. We need to come to that realization. This is the extent of our problem. We were not righteous, but made righteous by Christ. And so I pray for each one of us this morning that we would rep repent from the idea that we ever thought we could be good enough, that we could ever do enough good 
or be righteous enough. Repent from that, but revive as well in recognizing that Jesus Christ is good enough for us, is righteous enough for us, and that his grace overflows. And then let us go repeat. Repeat this to all. Repeat this to a world that thinks it's good, but is not. Repeat this to a world that is in pain and destruction and repeat that, hey, there's a savior out there who can be good for you. But this is not the extent of our problem. It goes deeper than this. Part of our problem is that we also do not understand. No one understands. What this is stating here, what the writer is trying to help us understand is that we truly don't understand what sin has cost us. We don't understand the consequences fully because if we did fully understand the consequences, we would not do it, but we still do. See, when Adam sinned, he brought much consequences on us. And part of those consequences were that we would not understand. And we would not understand what it would cost us, that life would become a lot harder. That's what Adam's sin did. That Adam's sin would have an impact on this creation, but even more so that Adam's sin would have an impact on sweet, beautiful relationships that we could have with one another. But because of his sin, those relationships become hard and difficult and painful and loneliness then exists in our world. We don't truly understand that's what our sin brings. And I'm sure many of you, as you sit here, as you think about the sins that you do, you recognize the consequences that they bring. But we don't understand it always in the moment, do we? In fact, if you were to ask a lot of people, if you could go back in time, what you would change, I'm sure some of us would say, I'd rather study this degree or do this other thing. But I imagine most of us, what we would say is that I wish I'd never done this or that because I recognize the pain and the consequences it brought. See, we don't truly understand what sin costs us. And we cannot understand before Christ. Have you ever had a conversation with a non-believer, if you are a believer? And as you have that conversation with them and you sit with them and they tell you the choices that they make, you sit there and go, why? Why would you make those choices? Why? And the reason is they cannot but make that choice because within their own ability, without God, they can only make those choices that would lead to hurt and pain. We need God to step in to help us understand, not only to help us understand the scriptures in this world, but to help us understand what our sin truly does. Because as we truly understand what our sin does and costs us, it helps us understand what Jesus Christ did. That when he came to the cross, as he died for us, he came to bring us understanding. And so as we listen to our next person as they come up, listen with that in mind, how you did not understand first, and then how Jesus brought you understanding. And as Le Leanne comes up, as you hear her story, listen to a woman who did not have understanding, and then how Jesus brought her understanding. So before I came to know Jesus, my life went through a desperately dark time. I'd recently unexpectedly lost my brother at the age of 31, and I'd gone through a traumatic divorce. My family lived overseas and I had built my entire life around my ex-husband and realized that I had few friendships that I could rely on in these difficult times. As a result, I was desperately lonely, struggling with compounded grief, and I would often numb that pain and overwhelming loneliness by smoking weed and I frequently contemplated suicide. I was lonely, hopeless, and I saw no way out of my pain. In this time, ironically, I taught at a Christian school, and we would often attend chapel with the, with the children. 
One week, the pastor used a very visual lesson. He had a bowl of water with a rock and a sponge. He described the water as the love of God. And when he placed a rock in the water, nothing happened. That was a hardened heart, unable to experience God's love. Then he placed a sponge in the water and it soaked up God's love. And he spoke of a soft heart. I walked out of the chapel that morning, unable to shake that imagery. In that moment, I could clearly see how hardened my heart had become. I was hard towards others and I was hard towards God. And I could almost hear God whisper to me, what would happen if you would just soften your heart just a little? For many months, I grappled with that sermon and I continued in my loneliness. I could almost hear God calling to me. And one day, out of frustration, I said, fine, God, I'll go and listen to what you have to say to me. I would sometimes drive past BBC, so I thought it was as good as place as any to go and listen. I sat right at the back. The first song that played unlocked so many emotions and the floodgates opened. As I listened to the song, it spoke of how I was not forsaken, that God was for me, not against me, that I was his child, loved, chosen, and that in his house there was a place for me. Those words tore apart my loneliness. In that morning, I understood the devastation of my choices and that Jesus offered a different way. I repented and I could sense Jesus lifting my face. I went to the front for prayer. The church was hosting a new believers course in two weeks time and the pastor encouraged me to attend. Unbeknownst to me, at the same time, a lady in this church felt a strong conviction to go to the new believers course, despite being a church member for many years. She received permission to attend the course. God knew that I would not have one family member or friend that was Christian and that I would need a friend. He lined up a friend for me before I even knew that I was going to church that morning. Her and I met at the course and immediately formed a friendship. When I struggled with understanding the Bible or Christianity, she would meet with me, listen to my questions and concerns and gently guide and encourage me. Within a few weeks, I joined a GC, and I was amazed at the authenticity and openness of these relationships that I was making. Their care, concern, and encouragement for me was tangible. Slowly, God healed my loneliness and placed me in a family of faith, full of friends willing to walk with me through difficult times. At times, I can barely believe the transformation from deep loneliness to deep, meaningful fellowship. Psalm 68 verse 6 says that God places the lonely in families and he leads out prisoners with singing. He took me from hopelessness into hope and I now know that God is with me and I will never be alone. Once again, I think we can relate to Leanne. That idea of not truly understanding what we did not have before Christ. The idea of not truly understanding what our sin was costing us. But when Christ steps in, he shows us the great richness this life can have. It doesn't make everything easy, but it shows us what this life could be. He shows us and gives us purpose in this life, whereas before we had none. He gives us understanding. And so this morning, once again, I pray that you'll repent. You'll repent that you ever thought you knew better. That you knew everything there was to know. That you knew what your sin was costing. That you'd repent from that. But then you would revive that hope and know that Jesus Christ has died for you to give you understanding, to give you community where before you had loneliness, to give you hope before where you were hopeless. And I pray that you would go repeat this. Repeat this to others. For those who are out there making terrible choices, for those out there who do not know what their sin is costing them, speak to them and help them understand what Jesus Christ has done for them. But once again, the extent of our problem does not end there. For me, one of the saddest lines in scripture is this, 
No one seeks for God. How deeply saddening is that verse that we cannot seek for God. We have no ability to do so. In fact, it's even worse than that. Before Christ, we have no desire to do so. Think about that for a moment. The God who created you in your, in your inmost being, the God who knows you, the God who created this magnificent world, the God who created this incredible creation, this universe, the God in which all goodness, all joy, all love, all kindness exists. We have no desire to even seek him out without his aid. What's even worse than that, he sends his son, Jesus Christ, to come die on the cross for us, for our sins. And before he comes into our life, we don't even want to know what that means. We need God's grace to aid us. We need God to step in because before God, there cannot be true faith. We need him to give us the gift of faith so that we can believe. We need him to give us undeserved grace so that we can be saved in order for us to truly seek him out. You had no ability to seek him out. And so Jesus Christ had to die for you so that he could give you a gift in order to seek him out. And as we come to our next story, I want you to keep that in mind. As you sat here before knowing Christ, before Jesus Christ broke into your life, before he gave you faith, you had no desire to seek him. In fact, you desired to go the other way. You needed God to step in. And so as James comes and shares with us, hear from his story. A man who was given the gospel but did not seek out God until God broke out into his life. James. I was born into a Christian home, and I remember my parents taking me to, Sunday, uh, to church every single Sunday. And I remember as well when I was a young kid, maybe three or four years old, in the bath with my mom, I remember praying a prayer and asking Jesus to come into my life. But something actually happened when I went to primary school. I became completely disinterested in God. I ended up getting into a lot of the things that uh, kids my age got involved in, drinking and swearing when I was a bit older, partying and things I'm very ashamed of. I remember most Sundays I would actually try and sneak into my parents' bedroom very early and switch off the alarm as quietly as I could. So hopefully they would oversleep and we wouldn't have to go to church. At the time, I didn't think I was a bad person. In fact, I thought I was a very good person. I had good grades, I was a prefect, and I was kind of that model student that every parent hopes their kid would be. For the longest time, I was not looking for a savior because I didn't really know that I needed one and I didn't think that I needed one. In about grade 10, I was asked by one of the youth leaders if I'd be involved in the annual kids holiday club. And this week actually turned out to be a massive turning point in my life. I just remember those devotions in the morning. I would hear about sin and what it really was, the depth of it. I would hear about Jesus' sacrifice on the cross and his grace and mercy and compassion on those he loves. And I would hear about the people, uh, my fellow youth leaders, sharing their stories about how God had broken into their lives, how God had changed them, and how God had loved them. Well, I'd heard these things many times before at church. This was really the first time that my soul had heard them. So I started to feel really convicted about the way that I was living my life. I felt convinced of the need to submit my heart and my life to Christ. And it's actually after this week at Holiday Club that I truly believe I became a Christian. 
that I started seeking out God as best as I could. Almost like a light switch, my desires, the intentions of my heart, not all of them, but a couple of them changed just like that. And I actually lost quite a lot of friends in high school because my intentions and desires were not the same as theirs anymore. We weren't interested in the same things. So while the last few years of high school were quite lonely, I think back and I'm so grateful for what I gained in Jesus Christ. From a kid who wasn't really interested in studying the word, even going to church, I didn't really care about the people at church. God changed something in me that I began to seek him out. So much so that I eventually started working, started leading worship and teaching in Bible studies. Really, God was demonstrating his power in changing my heart. None of that was what, be, what I did. It is 100% what God did. So when I think back to those days, I'm really saddened by the time I lost out in knowing God. I'm deeply saddened by some of the sin that I was involved in. But I am so grateful to know what God has done in my life, to see what he is making me into, to become more like Jesus. And I'm so grateful that I get to call Jesus Lord today. Once again, I think we can relate to James. The idea that we may have heard the gospel a hundred times, but did not respond and needed God to break in to help us respond to that gospel. Because before we could not seek. But when Jesus came in, when God came in, then we were able to seek. And I am so thankful for that. I, like James, am so saddened by the sins that I committed and the hurts that I brought upon people's lives. But I could not but do it. I needed God to change me. I needed him to give me faith, to true beautiful faith. And this is what God has done for us. Before I was a person who was not righteous, I could not understand and I could not see God that is part of the extent of my problem with sin. Not just the things I do, but these deep rooted things that were part of me as a human. I needed Christ to die for that so that I could become a person who would be seen as righteous. I could become a person who could understand and I could be a person who could seek a relationship with God. And that is open to each one of us today. And so this morning, I'd like us to take, take us in the first steps of truly recognizing our sin. I'd like us to repent of that. I'd like us to come to repentance for the things that we do. And part of the reason I want us to think about those things that we do is because of what Jesus Christ has already done for us, that he has died for the extent of this huge problem of sin that is so huge and yet his grace overflows even more than that. And so how are we gonna do that this morning? I'm gonna ask each and every single one of you to take the bold step and come down to the front and write your sin upon this red cloth representing Jesus's blood. Now I know that may be scary for many of you but I want to offer you two things to think about. First, as you think about why it's scary, I want you to ask this yourself this question. Why are you more scared of what man thinks and not what God thinks? Why are you more fearful of the man or woman sitting next to you and not of the God who did such an amazing work for us? Mike last week told us about access towards God. He told us that we cannot have access towards God because of his holiness and because of our sin. In fact, what he had to do was take his wrath that was meant for us, the death that was meant for us, and he had to pour it out onto his son 
so that we could have access to him. That's what God did for us. And yet, we are more fearful of what a mortal man or woman sitting next to us thinks compared to the immortal, eternal God that looks down upon us and gives us this access. We need to put that away. But secondly, the other thing that I want you to think about is that every single person here, every one of us has sinned. Every single one of us continues to sin. And every single one of us is ashamed of those sins. You are not alone. And so in order to help you understand that, when we are to come down and write, I want you to notice first that myself and others, pastoral staff, have already written their sins down here. They're evident for you to see. But I'm also going to ask the elders that are present and the pastoral staff that is present to be the first ones down in the line to come write their sins. Not because they're better, not at all, but to represent this idea, no matter how long you've been serving the Lord and following him, we all sin and we all have shame of sin. And so I'd like you to come write your sins in front of everyone. And this is the picture why we have it here is that we come and write our sins that have many writings on it already from the first service. Come write our sins and it sits here for a week because that's what our sin does. It sits in this world and causes pain. But here's the beauty of it. Jesus Christ dies for those sins. So on Good Friday, this red material will be put on the cross to represent this idea that Jesus took the weight of our sins upon his shoulders, took the punishment of those sins for us. But it does not end here because this is the beauty of Easter is that we have Easter Sunday. And so what will happen on Easter Sunday is that these will be taken down and destroyed because that's what Jesus' death and resurrection does, does for us. Our sin is paid for, destroyed, no longer held against us. And so I would ask us today, each and every one of us, come and take that first step of repentance. Come repent of your sins with every single one of us this morning. And for every single person here, but especially for those who do not yet believe, I want you to remember that we serve and worship a God who is a God of the living. Yes, we speak, we hear about how he saved many people in the Bible, but remember, he is the God of Tembi, the God who took a woman who was not righteous and made her righteous. He is the God of Leanne, the God who took a woman who felt lonely and did not understand and gave her community and love and gave her understanding. And he is the God of James, the God who took a man who could not seek him out and gave him faith so that he may know the richness of what Jesus Christ has done. And so this morning, as you come forward, repent of your sin. And then as you go back to your seats, sit and revive your joy as we sing our song about who Jesus Christ is and what he has done. Revive that joy. And then when you leave after the service, go repeat the great gospel that we have been given. If you do not yet know Jesus, I pray that when you come forward and write your sins, that you'll come find one or two of us here and come speak to us. So before we come forward and come down each of your lanes and just come right away over this space, let me pray for us. Father, thank you for this time. Thank you for each individual that is here this morning. I pray, Father, that as we're confronted by our sin, that we would recognize how great the problem is, a problem that has existed since the first man, a problem that we do not truly understand, a problem that stopped us from seeking you out and having a relationship with you. I pray, Father, that we would come to a better understanding of that problem so that, Father, we can truly appreciate what your son Jesus Christ did. Let us revive our joy in knowing your son 
died for all our sins and the problem of sin. Let us come to that realization, Father. I pray for that each person as they come down, Father, that right now in their heart, you would be raising that sin that they're ashamed of, that they are reluctant to bring into the light. I pray that you would help them bring it into the light today because it is already in the light because of you, Father, and that they could find healing as they do so. Thank you, Father, for your son and his great sacrifice on the cross. In his name, Jesus Christ, and by the power of your Holy Spirit. Amen.